right. All set? Okay. Well, please take out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans. We're at chapter 3. While you're doing that, a couple of real quick announcements. Um, I'm going to be sending out uh, in email and text uh, a little bit later this week uh, uh, the address for Thursday night's Bible study. Uh, normally, uh, we meet at, at Dennis and Natalia's house, and it's been such a blessing uh, every Thursday uh, there. But this Wednesday, keep this in prayer, please. Uh, Dennis is having major back surgery on Wednesday, so um, we're going to be moving the Bible study this week. Uh, so uh, Greg and Mary have offered to host it this week, so um, we're getting some information about out on the address for that for Thursday. Don't forget also Monday evening we have our online uh, Bible study. I'll send out information on that too that with the Zoom link. You just click and join us live for that as well. It's great to just fellowship throughout the week as well. So be watching for that email. Um, okay, so we are in Romans chapter 3. We got about halfway through the chapter last time. And we will pick up this morning where we left off last time in verse 19. Let's read through to the end, and then we will come back and, and go through it verse by verse. So Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Verse 21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. As we begin this in verses, again, 19 and 20, and then kind of you have to pull in verse 23 because Paul is kind of summarizing what we've been talking about these last several weeks touched on it many times, that basically starting in verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way through to where we are right now, Paul has been talking about the fact that all of the world is under judgment. All of the world is facing the wrath of God because of sin in our lives, because of the sins that we have committed. We have all, as it tells us in verse 23, sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He uses these terms in verse 19. Now we know. Verse 20, because, again, he's summarizing this together. Now we know that by the works of the law, no flesh is justified in his sight. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. And what does the law say, right? It's the law says, Jesus summarized it for us very, very distinctly, down to two, two, two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself said, all the law and the commandments hang on these two things. We spoke of the fact that this kind of summarizes, again, the righteousness of God, the rightness, the, the standard. And we all fall short of that standard. And he, again, tells us that in verse 23. We all fall short of that standard. But notice it says, very specifically, we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God. The splendor of God. The majesty of God. If we were going to 
put all together the divine attributes of God, who he is, all that makes him holy. We all fall short of that. We all fall short of the glory of God. And do you know that you and I were created and intended to share in that glory? That was God's intention from the beginning, is that that we would share in that glory. Adam and Eve enjoyed that, uninterrupted. The glory of God in the garden. It says that they walked with him. They, they, they 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 were a part of that. They enjoyed the glory of God fully, as much as they could in their created state. But that wasn't enough for them. They were enticed by the enemy. They wanted more than to just be a part and share in that. They wanted to be like him. They, they took the bait that the enemy put out there. That, you know, if you, if you just do this, you can be like God. Instead of following after him and doing what he, you can be independent. You can do your own thing. You can be your own God. And they bought into that. And sin then entered and cut off and separated man from the glory of God. And ever since then, that it's interesting, the, the tense of the word there, fall short of the glory of God. It, the tense of the verb there is continually fall short. We're continually in our efforts, no matter what it is that we do, continually fall short and fall far short of the glory of God. His holiness again. And in his word, he calls on us. He, he, he calls on us. He says, be holy as I am holy. That is God's heart, that you and I would be holy. It's also his requirement. <laughs> it's, without that holiness, without that, that, that meeting that standard, without that righteousness, again, none will see God. None will be able to enter into his presence. And it talks of that here again, that because through all of this, whatever the law says, as he's summarizing all of this, every mouth is closed. There's no one that can stand before God and give any excuse for themselves. There is, there is no defense. There's no blame shifting. Again, as we've emphasized over and over, and Paul has to this point for, for a couple of chapters and for us several weeks as we've gone through this, that all are guilty. All are fully and completely accountable to God. We all stand condemned in our sin. Hopeless, helpless. The works of the law, as it says here, can't and won't justify anyone. And how many are glad that it doesn't end in verse 20? Verse 21, two, two of the, the, starts off with two of the most amazing verse, uh, words in, in the Bible. But now, <laughs> but now, I, I, I love that, that, that word but. It's a contrast. It's a direct contradiction to what has just been stated. All of this leading up to that, all of this bad news, horrific news, to the contrary of that, but and the word now is, is an awesome word, too, because that means something's changed, right? I mean, there's a, there's a moment that was before, but now. Something's different now than before. Our status moved from condemned to justified. And it goes beyond just being pardoned. It goes beyond, justification goes beyond just being forgiven. It's a judicial term. It's a declaration from a judge in a trial. And it means that justice has been fully satisfied. Again, if somebody just said, no, you're you're pardoned, you're you're not going to be held accountable for that, that's totally different. This means that justice has been completely satisfied with respect to you and I. Free from from all guilt. Declared fully righteous. Declared innocent. Righteous standing before the judge. It's a judicial act of God the Father. And we have to remember that nothing changed in God. The but now does not mean that he changed or that the standard changed. 
He didn't say, well, you guys totally messed this up. And for, in, order for, in order for this whole thing to work out in the end, I'm just going to have to lower the bar down to, work, to your level. He can't do that. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. And this holy, righteous, just God is the one who makes this judicial declaration. One other thing with this, again, it's not just being pardoned, not being forgiven. It's not even about changing our condition. That comes later. As we continue to study through Romans, we'll get to that point. This is this declaration of being justified changes our status. It changes our standing from being a prisoner, like I said, a condemned prisoner, to a redeemed and justified free person, free man or woman. It's an extremely important distinction when we speak of this, because again, as we continue on through Romans, we're going to continue to to work this out. But justification is an act of God the Father as judge. It occurs outside of us, okay? It removes the guilt of the sins that we have committed. It's a once and for all declaration for us. It's not something that we continually go back. We continually, as as repeat offenses come, we go back and we have to keep going back before the judge and keep being continually declared righteous. No, it's a once and for all thing, and it has to, please understand this, it has to happen first in every one of us. Then comes sanctification. Justification, again, happens outside of us. It's an act of declaration by God the Father. Sanctification takes place in us. It's an act of the Holy Spirit removing the pollution of sin. Justification deals with the sins. Sanctification deals with the sinner. Okay, And we're going to get into that more as we continue to move through Romans. But it's an important distinction to make because in this section we're looking at right now, it is dealing with our sins, standing guilty before a holy God and being declared righteous. Sanctification, by the way, is one of those things that must follow justification. It's not an optional thing. Again, we'll continue to go through that as we get into chapter 6 specifically in, in Romans. But if you would right now, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And if you have one of those little, I don't know what the official term for this, there's probably some really cool Greek term or something, but this little Bible marker thing that you have um, in your Bible, um, put that that here in Hebrews, because we're going to come back and forth to this, this section, Hebrews 9 and 10, a couple of times today. But Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 10, And I want to highlight this not only for what it says, but to, to zero in on the tenses of the verbs because it can seem a little, a little confusing because the same word is used twice, and I want to be able to I want to point this out. Verse 10, Hebrews 10, verse 10. By this will, and he's speaking of the will of God the Father that Jesus fulfilled. Verse 9 says, Behold, I have come to do your will. Verse 10, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Now that word translated there, sanctified, been sanctified, is in the perfect tense in the Greek. That means it's a once and for all action that has been completed, that has ongoing results. And so again, this term could probably better be translated here, justified. This is what we're talking about, that once in a moment act thing that takes place in the life of every believer where the judge, our holy, God, our holy Father, God the Father, declares us righteous. Been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting on that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool at his feet. Verse 14, for by one offering... He has perfected for all time. 
we are justified for all time those who are sanctified. And that word sanctified is in the present tense, which should probably better be translated, are those that are being sanctified. Again, those two different elements that we're talking about. Justification, being declared righteous, being declared innocent before God. And then sanctification, that ongoing work in the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. And again, we'll, we'll hit this several times again as we continue to go through Romans because as that, that is, Paul works that out for us. But back to, and again, keep a, keep a mark here. We're going to come back to Hebrews in just a little, a little bit. But back to Romans after showing that we are all guilty and all deserve punishment as we cha- transition into verse 21, God reveals that there is this other facet of his righteousness in verses 21 and 22. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Again, his righteousness didn't change. We're just seeing a different facet of it. He provides a way for unrighteous, rebellious sinners to stand righteous before him. He promised the way through the law and the prophets. All the way back to Genesis, all the way through the, 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 the giving of the law and the sacrificial system and, and all of the festivals, all pointed to Jesus, all pointed to the fulfillment of, of his righteousness and the way that he would provide that way for you and I throughout the law and the prophets. And now he's saying, now manifested, now being able to be seen. It talks about, Peter talks about the fact that the prophets looked at these things and didn't understand what is this, that this savior, this Messiah, this one that is coming. Well, you and I now know. You and I now understand. It has been made manifest to us. Not by any action on our part. Again, notice, through faith. Not anything that we do. It's only by faith, but it's available that way to any and all sinners, entirely by his grace. Only made possible through the redeeming work of Christ Jesus that purchased you and I out of that place. Verses, again, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness again. His righteousness on display here. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed, pointing to this moment, For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Verses 21 to 24 kind of discuss, again, the way of salvation is outlined there. But verse 20, here are these these verses 25 and 26, the how of salvation. How is it worked out? The way of salvation, again, must be consistent with God's character. He didn't change. It has to be consistent. He can't just ignore sin. He can't just declare you and I sinless as sinners. It can't just be done that way. It had to be dealt with. It had to be paid. And here comes that word, that big word, propitiation. (laughs) What does that mean? What does the word propitiation mean? It's probably one of the reasons why we probably don't use it a whole lot is because we think it's a kind of a complicated word, but it's a very important word. And it, but it's a very simple one is what it means. It means that God is satisfied. The satisfaction of the requirement. Again, it's not a brushing away of it. It's the satisfaction of it. The Greek word is hil- hilasterion, and it's only used twice in all of, the, all of the New Testament. And again, it literally means satisfaction. Understand this before we look at the other, the other word, or the other time it's used. The only way, the only way that you and I, as rebellious sinners, can satisfy 
the wrath of God for the sin in our life is to spend eternity in hell. That is the only way that you and I can satisfy it because that's the punishment that we're due. Eternity in hell, facing the wrath of God, no, no possibility for parole, eternity. The only other way is redemption. The only other way is to have the debt satisfied by someone else. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. He is the one who gave himself for our redemption. Again, all witnessed to by the law and the prophets. Now, if you would turn back with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. Witnessed to by the law and the prophets. I mentioned that all of those things pointed to Jesus. All of the, all of the festivals, all of the, the things that outlined in the law, the things that had to be done, certain areas and elements of worship, specifically as we're going to look at one right now, the Day of Atonement. Chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil were, there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. Now, when Moses, was, Moses had this built, had this erected, God told him that this is a picture given here of what is in heaven. And again, symbolic of what is in heaven and what would take place with Jesus. Now, before, before he gets to that, notice it says this. In the Ark of the Covenant, here it's outlined. It tells us in, in Hebrews here what was in the Ark of the Covenant. The golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of, the, of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But, these were, but of these things we cannot speak in detail. Well, we're going to speak in a little detail. Author of Hebrews chose not to. I want to highlight a couple of things here before we move on. The Holy of Holies, again, this separate place where only one person, the high priest, could enter one time a year. That'll co come in just a second. But this was kept out of sight from everyone else. And in it was the Ark of the Covenant. In it, inside the Ark of the Covenant, it tells us was the golden jar with manna. Now, as the Jews, they were told to keep this manna as a reminder of what? Of God's faithfulness, right? Of his provision. Every day, every evening, the, the, the manna would come. They, were, they, they didn't have to go out searching for their food. It was brought to them while they were in the wilderness. The manna, God's provision. What else did it remind them of, though? No doubt. The fact that they complained about that provision constantly. Right? The fact that, that even though God said, this is exactly how you're supposed to do it, you only take what you need right now, don't take more, I'm going to provide for you more tomorrow. If you take more, it'll, it'll rot and it'll, it'll be disgusting in the morning. People still did it. People still tried it. So their rebellion against God who was providing for them every day, they complained about it all the time, even to the point where, where God sent them so much meat that they got sick from it because he was just tired of their complaining about it. So God's provision, but also that reminder of, man, he provided everything, but all I did was complain about it. Aaron's rod that budded. That, that again, God's miracle, right? That, but... What does that also remind them of, of, of? Was of rebellion. The only reason that that whole thing happened was because the people rebelled, starting with Korah and saying, who, who made you the, the ruler of all of this? I'm, I'm just as qualified as you are. And God, God then intervenes and says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your staff 
Aaron, and we're going to take your staff, Cora, and we're going to put them in, the, in the, this tent, and tomorrow morning come back and see what happens. They come back, a dead stick buds and has almond buds and everything all over it. Okay, so there again is, is God's miracle, but he says, now stick that in the ark, reminding them of their rebellion. And the Ten Commandments, right? God's law, put that in there. But what does that also remind them of? Again, their idolatry and their sin, because it's not the originals, right? <laughs> the originals were destroyed because when Moses came down and he saw them already, already turning away from God, already chasing after other things, creating idols and all of that, and he, did, he threw that. So that's what's in the ark, a reminder of their rebellion, a reminder of their idolatry, a reminder of the fact that even though God provided for them, they complained about it. Now, I highlight all of that because here we come to that other time the word is used. Because over the top of the ark was what? It tells us here, overshadowing, verse 5, the mercy seat. There's that other word, the other time that word is used. Over the top of the, of the ark that it contained those items that were, that were symbolic of their sin, their rebellion, was the satisfaction, the mercy seat. And that one time a year when the high priest would enter through, he would be bringing in blood, blood from the sacrificed animal outside, and he would place the blood on the mercy seat. So when then God is looking down from heaven upon that, he doesn't see the manna. He doesn't see the, but, the, the rod that budded. He doesn't see the, the copy of the Ten Commandments. He sees the mercy seat with the blood, and again, symbolic of as how the, God, how the Lord, when he looks upon you and I, propitiation, satisfied, Verse 6 here. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priest continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, for which is a symbol of the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Again, pointing to that time when Jesus will fully fully bring it to fruition. Again, the blood of animals can't possibly cleanse. But the blood of Jesus does. Again, stay here, but back in our, in our text, back here, verse 25, it says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. Jesus' blood shed for you and I. Propitiation, satisfaction, Full satisfaction. Guys, we have to accept the Father's valuation of the blood of Jesus. Because until we do, we will never see the value of it for you and I. I was trying to kind of think of how, how, do, how do we talk about, how do we even continue to go deeper into this? But what is the most valuable thing to any person other than their life, right? Because apart from our life, if, if we don't exist, nothing else around us matters, right? So our life is the most important thing. Now, other things in other people's lives and other, all of that other stuff, but without our life, none of that other stuff matters. And the Bible tells us that our life, what's, that, that our life, the, it's in the blood. The Bible tells us that. And it wasn't until just a few hundred years ago that science finally caught up to what the Bible told us all the way back. <laughs> that, oh yeah, li life is in the blood. Li blood is what carries oxygen to the rest of our, our body. Blood is what takes the contaminants back out. Blood is what moves all of that. Without, we used to, it, crazy as it is, we used to think that to make somebody healthy is to drain their blood out. <laughs> you know, and that was science. Now we know that's a crazy thing to do. 
life is in the blood. And again, the day of atonement here in Hebrews chapter nine, the blood of the animals could never remove sin. It only covered over, it was only a picture. But it's a beautiful picture because when the, when the animal was brought for the sacrifice, the animal itself was inspected, not the one bringing the animal, right? They, 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 they looked for, they, you were supposed to bring a lamb that was without blemish. And they didn't inspect the one bringing the lamb because the reason you're bringing the lamb is because you got blemishes all over you. That's the whole point of bringing it. The lamb unblemished and John was the one who looked at Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It all pointed to Jesus shedding his blood for you and I. The blood of Jesus has infinite value because God the Father says it does. God is satisfied because he shed his blood for you and I. And God alone determines that, right? It's not up to us to determine what is valuable enough to pay for my sin, right? It's not up to the one bringing something to determine if that's gonna satisfy the one we're bringing it to. There's nowhere in any type of economic system where that works, right? It's up to God and he is the one who said, This will satisfy the debt. And if my unpayable debt was completely wiped out because of the blood of Jesus, is there anything more valuable than the blood of Jesus to me? Our value of the blood of Jesus could never be more than it is to God the Father, right? It could never be more. But guys, it can't be less either. How do, you, how do you see yourself right now, honestly? That's, that's what we call our conscience. <laughs> how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as dirty? Do you see yourself as a miserable sinner? Or do you see yourself as clean? I guess the answer to that will kind of determine about what you feel about the value of the blood of Jesus. Again, in Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 9. It says, all of that before was a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices were, th- were offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Skip down to verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes heifers sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God. The blood of Jesus, guys, satisfied the Father, and it must cleanse our conscience. When we come under conviction, yes, we need to deal with that. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to us and sin in our life, things that are are not pleasing to God. We need to repent of that, but we need to understand that you and I are covered by the blood of Jesus. We are righteous before God. The enemy will use that all the time to continually bring accusation to us and to to make us ineffective and to bring us down. and, And guys, we can't allow that to happen. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. How do you approach God? On what what basis do you approach God? Honestly, on what what do you what do you you base that on when you go to God? Do you you think that that because you got up early in the morning and and you prayed and you spent time devotionally and and you did all of that, that God's gonna listen more intently to your prayer? 
If you really want him to answer, if you really want him to move, you think, okay, well, I gotta, I gotta do this and this and this first, and then, and then I'll be able to, then I'll be able to go to him. Again, we're just, I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm just asking. Let, let's just do a little personal inventory. Do you feel that that something comes to you and somebody says, hey, would you pray for me in this? Or I really need this, and you're like, oh man, inside thinking, man, I wish I could, because, but I can't because I just had this fight with my wife, and I. Oh, I just, uh, God's not, uh, you yeah. know, how do you see yourself? How do you approach God? Do you try to earn favor, get a little extra blessing? <laughs> Guys, it's always the same. We approach God on the basis of one thing only, the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10 again, just turn, turn the page in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, notice, by the blood of Jesus. It doesn't say we have confidence to enter the holy place because you, you did your devotions this morning or, or you tithed this week or you did any of those other things. No, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Nothing else can off, usher us in. By the new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full conscience of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, guys, it's always and only because of the blood of Jesus. Nothing else. God's righteousness demonstrated. Back to Romans, verse 26. Again, it, it speaks of this, you know, that, that the, the just and the justifier, he doesn't change his, his righteousness. He doesn't become less just. No, he's fully just, but he's also the one that met that full requirement and because of that verse 27 where then is boasting it is excluded by what kind of law of works no but by the law of faith for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law no boasting none whatsoever we have nothing to boast in in this the law of faith Jesus' life, death, resurrection, it's not a model to follow. Praise God. It's not about imitation. Can you imagine? That would make everything worse, right? Is the law was all laid out, and we realize and we recognize that there's no way I can achieve that, and then here comes Jesus, and he does it, and he turns around, and he says, all right, now you do it. <laughs> that would make it worse, right? It's not about imitation. It's about impartation. His righteousness given to us. The fact that he did it perfectly, credited to our account, because he took the fact that we messed it all up onto his account. Given to us. And that's why the Father looks at us as righteous. Because he did it and said, all right, put that on their account. And I'll take all of theirs onto mine. He met the righteous requirement. He took the full wrath of God that was due us upon himself and gave us eternal life that he obviously had as God, but earned by the way he lived his life here. He says, give that to them. Credit that to their account. I will take the punishment onto mine. Praise God. That's why, guys, when it says, you know, justified by faith apart from the law, do you realize how insulting that must be to God? That God, Jesus does it all and then says, here, and we say, okay, well, let me work for it. Let me, let, I, I got to do something. And he says, no, it's all done. Anything we do to try to add to it only tarnishes it, only cheapens it. 
Can I say something that may sound a little shocking right away at first, but hear me out. We are not saved by faith. Because if we were saved by faith, that would become a work. That would become something that I could boast in. I could look at somebody who's not saved and say, well, he doesn't have the faith I have. No, guys, we are saved by Jesus. We are saved by grace. Grace is a free gift. We are saved by grace through faith. We all have our fears and phobias, right? I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not. As a matter of fact, I, I look forward to that moment, as I, I'm sure most of us do. But the process? There, there's, a few, there's a few ways of dying that I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm a little fearful of, okay? And one of those, for me, probably at the top of the list, is drowning. I, I, that, that's just always been a fear of mine. And it just kinda, I, I, that's one of the reasons. In water, I can swim, and I'm OK in that, but I just am never comfortable in water. And so this picture, I get, I'm, I'm out swimming, and I, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out in the ocean. I'm out, down in Galveston or whatever, and I'm out swimming. And all of a sudden, I realize. I am way too far away to swim back to shore. I can't. I'm too tired. There's no way I can get back. And all of a sudden, I realize, too, I'm getting carried further and further out. I am hopeless. There is nothing I can do to get back. As a matter of fact, if somebody doesn't help me really soon, I'm going to drown really fast. All of a sudden, here comes this lifeguard out there and he comes and he pulls me back in and he saves me and he gets me back on the beach and I stand up and I go, man, look at, look at what I did. I trusted that guy to save me. <laughs> I get some of the credit, right? I mean, I trusted him. How silly would that be? That's why faith, faith is, our, our placing our faith in Jesus, it's not a work, guys. There's, there's nothing we can do. We can't and don't do anything. It's all done. Faith simply makes that eternal reality that Jesus paid the full penalty for all sin on the cross my reality. When we accept by faith that unbelievable gift we stand righteous and redeemed our sins forgiven before a holy and righteous god and then just to kind of bring us back kind of where we started it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god guys we now are ushered back into that the glory of god again his holiness his holiness he says, again, be holy as I am holy. Is that a command? Yes. But it's also an invitation. Be holy as I am holy. There's only one way to do that in Christ Jesus. And that's his heart. It's his requirement, but it's his invitation in Christ. His righteousness, not ours. Imputed to us, his holiness. For the sake of time, I won't have you turn here. Jot it down, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What does that say other than he has blessed us with the glory of God? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Wow. Closing out the chapter here. Verse 29, is the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, to all, all mankind. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Again, it's all by grace through faith to everyone. No different whether you're Jew, Greek, no matter, no matter what your background, no matter who you are, it's all the same. 
Do we then, verse 31, nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. God didn't do away with the law. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. He fulfilled it completely. Not only the righteous requirement of it, but the just penalty of it for you and I. Man, what a God we serve. What a Savior. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we are, we are in awe of you. We are amazed by your goodness. And Lord, we stand in awe of your glory, of your holiness, of your righteousness. And Lord, we are so thankful that you did not leave us to fend for ourselves because Lord, we, we know that in that case we would spend eternity separated from your love, facing your wrath. And that's what we all deserve. But now, but now, because of the unbelievable sacrifice that you made on our behalf, sending your only son to suffer and die in our place, we stand justified declared righteous by the work of another. Jesus, we are so thankful that you willingly, you willingly took our sin upon yourself, that you exchanged your perfect life for ours. You didn't, you didn't do it all, you didn't live it all out and then say there, do it yourself. You did it and then exchanged that for our lives. Lord, I pray that several things would, would occur in us even deeper this week as we just continue to, continue to work this through and allow your spirit to, to speak to us through your word. Lord, that, that our conscience would be clean. Lord, when conviction comes, we want to deal with that. We want to repent and, and turn to you. But Lord, we, we need to understand our our judicial standing never changes because of the blood of Jesus. When the enemy's accusations come, Lord, we meet them with the truth of your word. Lord, that we would come boldly to your throne, not because of what we've done or that we've earned anything, any right to come any more boldly than any other day. We come boldly because of the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would hear and you would answer and you would move in our prayers because of the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that it would also stir up in us a desire to be your instruments, to bring this good news to the world around us because it's available to them too. Use us in that way. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing one last song in worship together.